Hello everyone, uh, welcome to this week's CASA seminar. This week we are excited to have Danny Arribas Bell with us uh, from Liverpool Uni and now the Turing. Uh, Danny is one of our sort of leading lights in spatial data science, he talks about urbanism, he talks about urban economics, he talks about computation, he talks about new data. He is also, as you would have seen, one of the friendliest people in the field, so please don't be afraid to ask him lots of questions. Um, today he's going to be talking to us about uh, spatial signatures, which I think is part of a newish Turing project. Um, two bits of housekeeping. This seminar is on Monday because many uh, universities, including UCL, will be on strike uh, Wednesday through Friday this week. Um, in case any of you want to know why universities are striking, I will put a link in the chat uh, in a moment. Secondly, uh, rules of the game. Danny will talk for 30 to 40 minutes. Um, and then we'll have some time for Q&A. Um, he is happy to take questions uh, if you have urgent things that you want to ask him as you're going along. If you do want to do that, just unmute and ask. Um, and then we will be doing it more kind of econ style. Um, if you do have questions and you don't want to ask them straight away, put them in the chat or raise your hand when we're in the Q&A session and I will see them. If you have uh, questions that are actually comments or more general reflections, uh, please put them in the chat and we'll get to them that way. Uh, but Danny, the floor is yours. Cool. Well, thanks very much for the kind introduction and thanks very much for the invite. It's always a huge honor to, to speak at CASA. So I'm going to be uh, sort of dry testing a new setup and let me know if uh, you can, you have any issues seeing the slides um, and we'll go back and forth between this and full screen. But in some cases, I think it's probably, my slides are not super dense in general. So uh, there's, there's, not point, there's no point in, in filling up the whole thing. So as uh, Max said, this is uh, a talk on something that we're calling the spatial signatures, which is a way of looking and, at form and function. And I'm going to be presenting results for, for Great Britain. This is all uh, joint work with Martin Fleischmann who's done the really hard part of the project. And I just get to do the, the fun part, the talking today, for example. And also, as Max said, this is part of a, an ESRC fellowship with the Alan Turing Institute. So I'll start from the beginning. What, what, what's the point of, of these? Why would do we think that doing this project, and I'll tell you more about the project in a second, but why did we decide to, to spend quite a bit of time and effort on, on these? And the simplest way I have to present this is with the following slide is basically with the statement that how we arrange stuff, whatever, you know, stuff can be different things, but how we arrange stuff in cities matters. And whether we end up with a city that looks like the one on the left, which is uh, Washington DC, heavily planned, relatively dense, etc., or one or the one on the right, which is Phoenix, Arizona, the archetype of urban sprawl, very low density, no urban planning, etc. So whether you end up with a city that looks like one or the other ends up having a lot of uh, impacts on, on a variety of things, anywhere from sustainability, environmental sustainability, but also fiscal sustainability, um, productivity, social inclusion, etc. And for all of these things, there's quite a bit of, of research. So as Danny, I said... Just to, yeah. Sorry, just to jump in... Um, a lot of us are seeing these slides as quite blurry. So if you can switch ah, to regular okay. full screen. Let me, it did, uh, it's funny, it worked in the test, but it's obviously now of course. here. It's obviously hard. How is this? I'm going to go to the full uh, and then I'm going to take me that here. Looks a lot, that looks a lot better to me. Um, if people still have issues, please let me know in the chat. Yeah, and I don't... Yeah, I do have the, the chat. So cool. Everyone, okay. everyone is now much happier. So. Yes, we'll see how long that lasts. <laughs> Indeed. Thanks, Danny. Excellent. So as I was saying, um, this idea that how we arrange uh, things, whether those things are buildings or streets or, in, in fact, people and, and the activities that they carry out in cities, is something that's picked up attention from quite a few places, anywhere from academia, where there's, as Max was saying, there's a lot of attention in urban economics and around things like urban density, uh, but also environmental studies, where there's a lot of focus on how we build cities that 
for example, lead to lower emissions. And more recently, there's been quite a bit of attention on, on these topics also from the policy side of things. So anywhere from local authorities in, in the UK now, net zero is, is set to become quite a thing for the for the few years or centuries to come, uh, all the way to supranational organizations like the OECD or even the, the UN with things like the New Urban Agenda that la launched five years ago and has been pretty prominent in almost anything that, um, that the UN is doing now relating to cities. So when I said how we, are, we organize, how we arrange stuff, what I meant ultimately is at the end of the day, I was talking about urban form and an urban function. And let me say a couple of lines more about each. And I won't say much more than that, but I think it's important when we talk about form, we're really trying to answer the question, what does, what does it look like? What does a, a part of the city um, look like? What is its appearance and what is its physical structure? What is the built environment like? How does it mix with the natural environment, et cetera? And when we talk about function, what we're really meaning is what is it used for? What is this part of a city used for? What are the activities that take place within that environment? What is the kind of people or, or what um, populations inhabit those spaces and also what populations work in those spaces. And in fact, for most of uh, the analysis will be more focused on what people do rather than what people sleep at night at a, at a given place. So the, the premise of the project was really to hit the sweet spot at the intersection of these three uh, areas for that we, or three characteristics that we would want for a classification that looks at um, form and, and function and, and we're trying to hit the middle spot on this Venn diagram because we kind of realized that of all of these three any pair of them are already covered by the literature but we couldn't find um, at least enough that we thought was was good enough that covered the three of them so we found ways of looking at form and function that are detailed and consistent but they tend to be use cases on, on one town or one city, one metro area at max. Um, you can find consistent and scalable uh, approaches to, to looking at urban form and function, but then they're usually not very detailed because you have to give up on, on how much, um, how many characteristics, how you can measure them, etc. And I suppose that you can also find um, a detailed and scalable look at urban form and function, but this would have to come from the myriad of studies that consider urban form and function at, at very small scales. And that when you put them together, they do cover quite a bit of um, quite a bit of ground, but they're not necessarily consistent. So comparisons are to be made with, with a lot of caution. So what we're trying to do with this project is hit the jackpot in the middle and create a detailed, consistent and scalable classification that looks at, at form and function. And to do this, um, we developed this, this concept that we call spatial signatures, which you can think of it as the intellectual building block on which we're gonna build, um, we're gonna develop this this classification and hopefully this understanding of how urban form and function interacts with each other, but also how it, it uh, is distributed over, over space. So what are the spatial signatures? We, the, the shortest we could come up with is um, this pit, which is a characterization of space based on form and function designed to understand urban environments. So let me unpack this a little bit more because uh, there's quite a bit that, that's kind of in, in between words. So the first thing to I would like you to keep in mind is that it's a characterization of space. So ultimately we're gonna be delineating boundaries for different types of, of form and function. And ultimately you can think of this as a massive exercise on overlaying a gigantic cookie cutter on top of a Great Britain and using it to divide it into spaces or into areas, smaller polygons that are consistent when it comes to their form and function. Uh, 
The second one, I've kind of said it already, but I want to stress it, is that this is based on form and function together. There's quite a bit of literature that looks at, at function or different aspects, different types of functions individually. And there's also quite a bit of literature for uh, particularly in morphology and, and architecture that looks at urban form. There isn't quite as much that considers the two together. And we think that to understand cities, um, you need to look at the two together and also that there is quite a bit of synergies when you look at the two together. So if you have questions around this, this is also something that we can pick up later in the discussions on why form and function, what are, or at least what we think are the, the benefits. And then the final one, which might seem obvious is if you know some of my work, but it might not sound that obvious if you're used to characterizations of space, is that this is focused on, on urban environments. So although we do delineate the entire geography of Great Britain, which is, as you will see, for the most part, not urban, uh, we're doing that delineation with an idea of our understanding urban environments. And this is, I think, what a, one of the key departures from other large scale, consistent and detailed characterizations that you can find of, of space. So the most popular comparison that people might draw uh, with this project is uh, land use and land cover classifications. And there are some similarities, but also when you think, when you really look in, into the detail of most of those classifications, they're, they're classifications of the landscape and they, they're trying to understand what the earth is covered with. And as it turns out, very little of the earth is covered by cities. So usually they end up having a single or, or a couple of classes that say, this is a city. And that's it. And, and what happens within the city is kind of ignored because the focus is understanding whether something is one of the 15 different classes of forests or seven different classes of marshes or all those things that I don't know much about, by the way. With the spatial signatures, we're flipping this upside down and we're saying we're going to classify all of the geography, but we're going to focus on cities. So you will see later that even though cities are not most of the space, they're most of our focus and they will be, and that will be reflected in, in the classification. So how do we build these, these spatial signatures at a more pragmatic level? And this is a, a slide that I'm probably gonna spend a couple of minutes and there might be questions. And as Max said, I'll be happy to take them on the spot or if you want to come back to this later, either of them is, is fine. So the idea of building spatial signatures is similar in some ways to building um, other types of classifications like geodemographic classifications, but there's a couple of pretty core differences. And most of that has to do actually with the spatial unit that we're using. So I'm gonna spend a bit more time on that. Once you build a spatial unit and you attach the data that you have, then it's pretty similar to geodemographic classifications and in fact other um, other types of classifications that that you may you may come across. But how we build space into these this classification is quite important for us and, and hence we spend quite a bit of time. So we uh, divide this process into these three uh, types or these three phases. The first one is delineating the spatial unit in itself. So we don't use a, a, an ancillary or, an, or a secondary unit that someone else like the Office of National Statistics has developed. Uh, instead, we create our own, which is this term here, the enclosed tessellation, which generates enclosed tessellation cells, which will be our units. And then for each of those units, we embed form and function, which is to say we derive certain measures for each of those units that we attach. And then once we have those, then we classify and we cluster them into groups that are consistent. And the aggregation of those is what we will call spatial signatures. So let me tell you a little bit more about how we do these. And you can follow on the top uh, the, the progression as, as we're going along. And then on the columns, there are the three different phases. So, we start with what we call uh, geographic delimiters, and these, in our case, are going to be mostly street networks, but you can think of delimiters in the uh, David Lynch type of way, things that divide space that uh, when people think about how they read and how they interact with cities, these are things that kind of act as dividers. So we take streets, we take highways, we take railways, and we take rivers. Um, those are the ones that we will be using for the application, but conceptually you could maybe think of others and they might fit 
also. Whoops. Oh, sorry. Um, then we sort of blend all of those delimiters into these enclosures that we call, which are polygons that delimit the space that doesn't have any, sorry, yes, I did meant uh, Kevin Lynch. I knew there was a David, but in this case, it might've been Kevin. So once we have all of these delimiters, we sort of blend them into this one layer of polygons that gives you the, the common denominator, right? This the smallest unit that is not divided by any delimiter. So in the simplest case, you could think of a block that is delimited by four or three streets and then enclose that space. That would be one, one polygon. And then this delineation, we combine it with buildings that we call the, the anchors, because um, in there's a lot of urban theory that all, or urban morphology that also thinks of buildings as these anchors of, of the landscape as, and, and of cities. So the way we, we do this is um, we overlay the enclosures with the buildings and that gives us the enclosed isolation. So, for every building, we draw a buffer. Is like uh, it was a tessellation that we do within the uh, within each polygon, and that gives us for enclosures that have more than one building, it divide it subdivides that space. For enclosures that have one building, is the entire enclosure, and for enclosures that don't have any building, is the the same polygon, and this is going to be the actual unit that we will use throughout all of the study. Why do we go through all the pain of uh, coming up with this entire new geography, which, which is non-trivial to create and to, to run at scale? Because we think that it embodies a lot of the aspects that we care about when we try to measure urban form and function. And I'll talk a bit more about that later, or I'll, I, rather I'll give you an example on how we think this is actually a good, good choice, but I'm, I'm open for discussion. So... The enclosed tessellation gives us a, a delineation of polygons that cover the entire geography of interest and that are based on, on form and function, but they're just a delineation, a geography. Then to that geography, we're going to be attaching a lot of data that describe the form and the function of each polygon. And this is what we call in the second phase, the embedding form and function. And I'll talk about a bit more about that in a couple of slides. This is going to give us effectively, if you if you're the data nerd kind, this is going to give us a very large table where every row is each of these polygons, and every column is each of these characters. We call these form and function descriptors characters, or variables, and we feed these to a, an unsupervised learning algorithm, a clustering algorithm that gives us groups of similar polygons. Right, every polygon in the same cluster is going to have it was going to be at least more similar to everyone else in the poly in the cluster than to other polygons in other clusters. As it turns out, a lot of these uh, classes or a lot of these polygons that are near each other are going to be of the same class. No less because we're going to have something in the order of 14 million polygons grouped into 16 categories. So a lot of these are going to be contiguous. And for those, we dissolve the boundaries within the class and within geographic contiguity. And that gives us larger polygons or aggregations of enclosed tessellation cells that have the same label assigned to that, that are part of the same cluster. And these polygons is what we're going to call signatures or spatial signatures. Okay, so let me go through that very quickly again entirely. We start with what we call these delimiters, these streets, railways, highways, rivers. We blend them all into this one massive cookie cutter. And then we overlay buildings on top of that layer, which we use to subdivide some of these small polygons into even smaller ones that have at maximum one building, but in some cases, no buildings. And we call these enclosed tessellation cells. This is our base spatial unit to which we attach a boatload of data that describe the form and the function of each polygon. We cluster those. And then once we have them clustered and labels are assigned, we dissolve those that are contiguous, geographically contiguous to create what we call spatial signatures. And if there's uh, any question 
feel free to jump in or we can return to this slide later. It took me a really long time to code this in HTML, so I'm very happy to spend more time on, on the slide if you're interested. So that's conceptually how we're envisioning this idea of looking at form and function um, over space. What I'm going to present results for is, is for Great Britain. So for Great Britain, for this uh, case study, we're looking at uh, a whole lot of characters that describe form and function. For looking at form, we use things like dimension, shape, intensity of uh, building or intensity of uh, certain classes, connectivity of those buildings to other buildings through the street network, car connectivity characteristics of the street network, diversity of the type of buildings and the type of um, shapes that we have. A lot of these comes from a field called morphometrics that is um, has emerged in the last few years from the urban morphology um, domain, which comes itself from mostly architecture and, and urban studies. And this gives us a whole lot of um, ways of characterizing urban form. To look at urban function, we look at things like population, employment, industries that are located there. So what kind of economic activity takes place there? We sort of complement that with land use and land cover. And we also include a lot of information on access to different amenities. Taken all together in, I mean, I, I don't remember the whole list by heart, no less because my memory is bad, but also because there's about 300 characters for each. The reason why we have so many is because for many, for most of them, actually for each cell, we don't have a single measure. What we have is a summary of the distribution of that measure in its cell, in the cell itself and in its own context. So because a lot of these cells are very small, looking at what is the... Um, you know, proportion of land uses in one cell, it's, it's not very useful because at best it would be 100% for one class. Well, not at best, but in most cases it would be 100% for one use, zero for everything else. And if we, and we want to capture the extent to which there might be mix of uses or there might be um, population and employment. So to capture that, which is really a, a feature of the geographic context of each of these small polygons, we average over, we, we kind of run a spatial window over each, uh, each cell. And if you're interested in how we do this and how we did it at scale, I'm, I'm happy to talk because it was uh, one of the nightmares of Martin last year, but we learned quite a lot. And I think we finally got it right. So if you're interested, I'm happy to go about this a bit more later. And what kind of data do we use for these? Again, I'm not gonna have a, an exhaustive link uh, list of all of this, but for form, it's actually very simple. We use uh, open data sets from the Urnan survey, most of it, the open map that gives us building footprints and open roads that gives us uh, everything else, street networks, highways, um, railways, et cetera. And then we use open rivers for, for rivers and water bodies. Uh, why we use the open data sets when there's something like master map that it's arguably a bit more detailed, because we're really interested in making, and we'll talk about this maybe a bit later, all of the results that I'm going to show you eventually will be made available as an open data product. I think one of the main goals of the project was to make the outputs available. So when people want to uh, look at things that relate to form and function, they don't have to go through the pain that we went and they can just sort of import spatial signatures and they're ready to go. And to be able to do that, we needed to have all of our input data open or at least releasable, derivatives releasable and, and, and master map is not, just doesn't, doesn't cut it. And then for business, we use the uh, business census from the CDRC, a lot of open street map for some amenities, geolytics for other amenities, listed buildings for historic amenities, uh, some for the CDRC, Corinne, which is a land use, European land use classification, Sentinel-2, which is um, a satellite mission, uh, the VIRS from NASA, which gives you um, light intensities and, and a few others. Okay, so that's the prelude. Now the, the actual, hopefully, punchline of the talk. This is what, we're, what we found or what we're, what we're finding and, and any feedback um, on the following would be most welcome. I mean, on all of the parts, but particularly on, on the results. So what are we... What do we find? Well, we our clustering of all of the 
uh, tiny polygons of which, as I said, we, we have 14 million. Our clustering um, seemed to converge towards 16 classes, and that's what we ended up with. And even though we the clustering itself doesn't tell us that some of them are countryside, others are periphery, um, when we looked at them and described them, we came up with this sort of aggregation where we have three classes for things that we call countryside. So places where humans don't live necessarily and don't live very, very much. Uh, then things that we call in the periphery of urban areas and then classes that we would more comfortably call parts of cities or, or that meet the um, urban characteristics. And as I was saying before, we're kind of flipping around. If you look at land use classifications, I think Corinne has about 40 classes. And when we looked at it, Martin and I found five that describe cities out of 40. In our case of 16, we have three that describe things that are in cities and in a, in a broad sense, and the rest describe things that are part, parts of cities. So just to give you a, a taste of what this actually looks like, here's an example of the Scottish urban belt, the, the part of land that stretches from Glasgow to, to Edinburgh. This is the delineation with all of the classes. And um, if you focus on each of them, the countryside is this one, which as you can see, takes most of the area, but takes most of the area that is empty of people. The, what we call periphery is somewhat in the, well, periphery of, of cities. And it also includes some uh, smaller towns and, and sort of outskirts of smaller towns. And then the areas that are, uh, identified as urban kind of pick up the centers, the, the cores of, of urban or corner basins of urban urban areas. And this is, I, I like the Scottish belt because in one shot you can show all of the classes, but you can imagine that these um, unfold similarly across the rest of the geography of, of Great Britain. Now, because we don't have 14 million polygons, it's about 70,000 signature polygons. But it's still really hard and really tricky to, to show you maps that convey the, the richness of what we find. Here is a couple of ways in which we were trying to think of summarizing. And, and please let me know if it comes intuitive or if there's any aspects that, that you don't really um, understand what we're doing. So the first one, just to give you a quick summary, almost like infographic style of the, the coverage of our classes, both geographic and, and not. This is what we call the countryside which is 94% of the area of Great Britain. Um, so 94% is where you would have a hard time finding a human being, um, or at least a human being living or spending quite a bit of time beyond farming. And that's divided into, between something we call wild countryside, so nature that's not really um, transformed by humans, countryside agriculture, which is areas that are nature, but transform, so uh, farming, agriculture, etc. And then the uh, the blue one, the urban buffer, which as you, you might have picked up on the on the map is it's almost consistently a ring, an outer ring around every city. And this is what we call countryside. It's 94% of the area, but it's 50% only of the uh, uh, enclosed desolation cells. And this is one of the reasons when I said before, we, we spent a lot of time role in our own unit is because we wanted our unit to reflect and to focus on the parts of the landscape that we want and nature is not necessarily what we want so even though it covers most of the geography it's only half of the of the uh, data set then the second one what we call the periphery there's a class called open sprawl uh, then there's another one that we loosely call warehouse or parkland which is a mix of uh, industrial parks and actual parks, um, golf courses and, and so on. And then there's two classes that we uh, label suburbia, one that is disconnected, which is tends to be uh, harder to access and with a, a network layout, with a street layout that it's it makes it actually really hard to move around. And then what we call accessible suburbia, which is lower density um, sort of larger houses, et cetera, but in ways that are made more accessible. And then sort of the, the cream, the, the top of the, of the cake, the, 
what we call the urban classes, and we have nine classes here, even though it only covers 1% of the geography. And again, here it's flipped, right? So it's 1% of the, of the geography, but it's actually 10% of the units of the polygons that we have delineated. Again, because it's, it's, the enclosed tessellations are really good at giving you granularity in, if you sort of think of how they're delineated, it, they'll give you a lot of granularity in city centers with very small polygons, and they'll have really large polygons in areas where there isn't any uh, much activity going on. So here we have, I, I won't go into all of them, but we have denser neighborhoods, um, some of them more with more regular layouts, some of them less. And then we have this sort of hierarchy that I'll talk about in a second of urbanity that goes from local urbanity to all the way to what we call hyper-concentrated urbanity and concentrated urbanity, which are two classes that only appear in, in London, which in, we, in itself we, we find interesting. So that's the, the coverage. Here is a, a map of uh, what we call distribution and co-occurrence. And I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on this slide because there's quite a lot going on here. So let me uh, deconstruct it as it were for you. On the top left, you see the whole map, which doesn't tell you much other than most of Great Britain is actually wild nature or farmed nature. And in England is a lot more farmed and in Scotland and Wales is a lot more wild. Um, but in most cases, this is the main class as we've seen, remember 94% of the area. So beyond that, you can't really see much more. Now, what you have here is a matrix that has 16 columns and 16 rows, one column and one row for each class. And you probably can just, maybe you can just about read it. And if not, it's not, it's not super important, so don't worry. But every row is the classes that I've just walked you through. So here we have countryside agriculture, wild countryside, uh, open sprawl is there, then regional urbanity, local urbanity, etc. So all of the classes are on the rows and on the columns. So what you're seeing in the matrix itself is the diagonal is empty because what we're showing here is for every two pair of classes, how much of the boundaries of that class is shared with this other class. So we want to see to what extent when you have one class, you're also finding another one next door, right? So what you, we've sorted also the matrix, it's not random, we've sorted it so that the highest percentages, these highest percentages are close to the diagonal. So it's a little bit easier to read. And I won't go into all of the detail because it might be probably quite a bit of time and, and uh, maybe not the most useful, but there's a couple of bits that are super useful, I think, at least to understand this idea of, of urban hierarchy or, or hierarchy of urbanity more than urban. So if you see there's, you know, there's, quite a bit few values of the diagonal on the top part, but as you go down, it's pretty much entirely only one class, right? And that's because on the bottom uh, right part, what we have is these urbanity classes. What I call, what I told you that there were some that only happen in, in London and then others that only happen in the city center, in the core, in the urban core of, of um, urban areas. So. The fact that you only have one value, it is, is basically telling you what you have here is a concentric uh, hierarchy where hyper-concentrated urbanity only happens at a core. And then it's entirely, you can you can fully make it up maybe, but the number here is 100%. And it tells you that all of the hyper-concentrated urbanity is surrounded by concentrated urbanity. And this is because it's the center of London. So we only have that class in London and it's surrounded entirely by this other class that is still very urban because you only find it in London, but not as much as the hyper-concentrated, right? We had a really hard time coming up with names. So at some point we got to concentrate and we still have one more class. So that's hyper. And this pattern of almost like concentric rings sticks around a little bit for the other classes for what we call metropolitan urbanity. So this is the core of the metropolitan center. So you will find you would find that in Birmingham, in Manchester, in Edinburgh, uh, 
And then it still happens in what we call regional urbanity. So that would happen in slightly smaller cities like Sheffield, maybe Liverpool. And then maybe a little bit also in what we call local urbanity, which is um, small, smaller town high streets. And then once you get after that, you're basically moving into non-central parts of the of the city or of the geography and then there's a lot more interaction and a lot more mix and you can find a lot more combinations of one class being next to the other and there's still a few things that you observe but but um there's a lot more uh, mixing and then as you go to the other end of the classification you you almost find similar things right so for example in the extreme you would never find any kind of urbanity right next to wild countryside right or wild nature there is the the geography is laid out in a way that you never find that that abrupt change and that's entirely picked up this is entirely data driven we haven't imposed any class or any uh, any delineation that is not um emerging from the data so that's what we have in these in this matrix and then what you see on the sides of the matrix is um it's almost like a histogram of where you find those classes uh, here is in the um, where you find those classes along the east and north in area and then here on north sorry east and west area so from east to west and here from north to south and we we think it's it's useful in some ways it picks up very obvious things um, but in other ways, we, we, we find things that are pretty, pretty cool. So almost any urban class is more concentrated in the south and in particular in London, but mostly in the south. And you can see quite visually the lumpiness, right, of, of the urban landscape, while the more natural one is less lumpy and is mostly, uh, if, it, if it, what I was saying before, um, wild nature is mostly Scotland or uh, Wales, so either on the east or on the north or on the northeast, and then farmed and agricultural wild land or, or countryside rather is more in, in the south and that picks up most of England that is not urban. And you can also kind of spend a bit more time, we've spent way too much time trying to find stories. You can unpick many stories, but the, the key sort of areas I think are, are these. And if you're interested, we can come back to, to more of these later. Danny, you've got a couple of minutes left. Yeah, uh, this is I'm on my on my last slide, or last couple of slides. So this idea of urban hierarchy, I'm not going to spend too much time because I've I've hinted, well, more than hinted at that in the previous slide. Um, here is quite a quite a bit of arrows and things that you know may be complicated, but what we're mapping here is for every city, every um, metro area, we come up with this circular these that because they kind of they look like a like a dish we call dishes and because they uh, represent signatures we call signature dishes uh no pun intended and you can see a couple of examples here and what we're doing here is we're grouping them we're grouping cities so every signature dish is a single city we're grouping them in a hierarchy of what is the most urban class that every city has so at the very top the only city that has the hyper-concentrated urbanity is London. The metropolitan urbanity, there's a few more, but not you could count them with maybe your two hands. Uh, and there's things like Glasgow and Manchester is here. Then beyond, below that one, there's regional urbanity. There's things like Newcastle, Plymouth. And then below, there's a whole host of cities uh, where the, the, maxim, the, the most urban one is what we call local urbanity, the most urban one is what we call dense urban neighborhoods or so not even cores. And again, this hierarchy that sounds, in, well, to us intuitive at least, is entirely derived from the data. We haven't said you have to meet certain criteria for being in, in the top or to be in the second one. This all comes from the, from the data. And then the final, final slide, and I'll, I'll wrap up with this one, just to give you a sense, it's, it's a little tricky to describe and synthesize what makes a polygon be part of a class because there's 300 variables that contribute to that decision. But one of the trends that we found the most interesting and we thought it was really cool is that to divide something between 
countryside and peripheral and even peripheral and urban, you're pretty much fine with form. Once you get into um, more urban detail, you need function. So the way uh, that that's what this slide tells you, we run a, a bunch of random forest classifiers for every class. And we looked at the uh, feature, what's called the feature importance. So what are, for, what are the variables that help you predict the most each class? And then we rank them here. So uh, every column is one of our classes ranked from the least uh, urban, which is the wild countryside, all the way to the most urban, which is the hyper-concentrated one. And then every row is, the top row is the most important feature that helps you predict that class. The second one is the second most important, and then is the top 10, even though there's 300. But once you go beyond, beyond 10, it is not that relevant. And what you see is that on the left side of the, of the um, figure, you see mostly blue and definitely at the top is blue. And it's only as you start working towards things like local urbanity, disconnected suburbia, regional urbanity, concentrated urbanity, that the yellow ones start crippling up. And this is, this is the areas where it is function, functional variables that help you predict most the class as opposed to form. So on in the interest of time, if you're in, you know, we can pick that up again if you're interested, but I'll, I'll leave it there. And then just to very quickly wrap up, uh, just if you have to walk out with three three points to remember from this talk, the, the first one is hopefully I convince you the urban form and function matters. That is, is worth spending some time and effort. And if you believe that, then the spatial signatures is effectively form and function for cities in detail at scale. And now that is done on, on demand almost. And the whole point of this is that good measurement of, of these um, things at scale will allow us to have much better understanding. And if you think of what you, what you would need to get the kind of insight and re results that I've just presented, um, it would be really hard to do with something that's not detail uh, consistent and, and granular. You need the three of them, otherwise you, you, can, you can get there. And on that, I'm, I'm gonna stop and, and take questions if anyone is interested. Thank you very much. Thank you, Danny. Um, that, I mean, that was a hugely kind of rich and complex presentation, but also one that you put across very kind of clearly and intuitively as, as well as you know, it's a very kind of visually uh, appealing thing. I'm glad to see people are asking in the chat all the questions that I wrote down during your talk. So we should just go straight over to those. Um, I want to start with Anna's actually, because I think this is fundamental. So she asks, I mean, can we interpret anything meaningful if we run signatures over time? So you know, we know that form and function are things that drive each other, but given function tends to change at a higher frequency, what would that tell us if we if we did something dynamic? Yeah, that's a, a great question. Um, and in, in fact, it's kind of the, so what I've presented is half my fellowship at Turing. The other half, which were, you know, right in the middle of that now, um, is get is trying to get at that. It's a is a much harder problem to crack, um, as you can maybe imagine. Um, but we're we're trying, and and hopefully maybe check in a year, a year and a half, and and maybe I'll have more more useful insight. And uh, until then, I have educated guesses, I suppose, uh, based on what we uh, on what we look on what we've learned from these um, exercise so far. So, I mean. I, Our sense is that sort of form follows function to some extent, but once form is, you know, comes in place, it kind of constrains and determines function, right? And because of the nature of both, as you said, Max, function changes more rapidly, but also changes more rapidly within certain bounds that are actually drawn or provided by, by form. So in other words, uh, you can convert the disconnected suburbia into a regional urbanity relatively quickly by throwing in a few amenities, but it's really hard to go from regional urbanity to wild countryside. In fact, almost impossible, right? And also once again, the other thing comes, comes similarly, right? Once you have 
certain form, like disconnected or connected suburbia, is really hard to have certain functions like uh, agricultural uh, farming, etc. I suppose, I mean, a lot of what, what I'm telling you here is, an ed I say that it's an educated guess, because to the extent that geography gives you variation, you can maybe think of from what we know about different places, you can think of how things change by looking at different places that you can assume. And this is an assumption of um, being at, different, at a different stage. But the notion of hierarchy, I think, kind of comes in, you know, I think it's a natural way of thinking at it that, you know, these hier hierarchical structures are everywhere. And, you know, there's no better place in, on earth than Casa to know that there's certain distributions, that there's, you know, almost everything follows a distribution where there's a lot of something of one type and then very few of another ones and then things in between. There's very few very large cities and a lot of very small cities. There's very few super productive firms, but a lot of very not that productive firms and, and so on, right? And, and what we see with form and function is that actually you kind of see that this is not as direct because this is more of a qualitative understanding of form and function you don't we don't have a score that goes from zero to 100 but we can see that that's kind of my where i'll stop with the educated guess and i'll give you just more a couple of points on what we're going with now to kind of try to look at these empirically um a lot of the project actually was pitched on the basis of using satellite imagery and, and artificial intelligence to and to look at these patterns so even though this in itself we think is very interesting in the context of the project is basically labeling a data set so we can then train an algorithm that will recognize these classes from images. And the idea is that once we have, now that we have the classes, we can try to train an algorithm that will look at a satellite image and will tell us this is, or I think with 90% of confidence that this is regional urbanity and not an urban buffer or open sprawl. And that in itself, I think, if it happens, it'll be cool because it'll basically show that a lot of these gets reflected in, in what you can see from space. But also there's a much more pragmatic point in that satellite images are refreshed a lot more quickly than any ordnance survey data set and for sure the combination that we use. So you can think of how we might be, we might start building a panel of these classes rather than a single cross section. And, you know, this still feels a little bit like science fiction to me, but we're getting close to that. And, and that's certainly what we're trying to do in the project. So for now, check in 18 months and we can have a more, sort of a better discussion, hopefully. Thanks, Danny. That's a, a very, complete answer um we have a bunch of questions now so i'm gonna i'm gonna sort of bundle a couple of them i think um so lizanne asks um this is more of a technical question for the lower spatial unit how do you determine where to draw the borders between different buildings um have you compared your method to areas where plots are known um yeah that's a and then, really good. And then let, let me just it. pop a couple more in. And then that's a that's just a couple about um about the kind of data build layer of it. So Robin asks, did you include school performance or other public services? And Nicholas asks, um, you know, how do you deal with the fact that your variables might have their own time series if you're trying to get a cross section? And then there's a bunch of other questions which we, we will come back to in the final round. Cool. So, okay, in terms of the technical ones, I'll start from easier to answer to, to slightly trickier. We didn't include school performance. Um, that would be good in that it, it gives you more granularity into one type of function, um, but we, we didn't. We did include things like schools, hospitals, um, et cetera, in the amenities layers, but we didn't. So that was one. Uh, let me see what were the other ones. Um, so that with time, the different points in yeah, different points in time, we picked roughly the same point in time, and of course that is really hard. But we picked something around 2019, and it's it's measurement error. Everything sort of a, around that is measurement error. But we didn't. We picked the closest to the most recent that we could. Um, and 
that's that's kind of how we went uh so that's time and then the for the lowest space of union how do you determine where to draw the borders between buildings so this is actually uh it built on another paper of martin's phd in his phd he came up with something called the um morphological tessellation which was drawing these uh fully exhaustive tessellations from buildings only so if you're familiar with voronoi tessellations or delonate tessellations which is something that you do for points so if, if you have a, a, a two-dimensional point cloud you delineate voronoi by um giving to every point every portion of the space that is nearest to that point than is nearer to that point than to anyone else so what martin did in that project was extending that to the geometry of a polygon rather than a point and then what we do is we do that within the enclosure so if you have one polygon that says that say has two buildings the buildings will be building footprint not points but what we do is we grow this tessellation where every um every point that ends up in the tessellation is closer to the building that is in that polygon than to the other one that's how we how we did it and then have you compared your method to areas where the actual plots are known for fidelity? We didn't for these, or well, I suppose we didn't quantitatively. Um, we did examine quite a bit and Martin has done a little bit of these uh, in the past. And even the one that is not um, enclosed matches, rel well, <laughs> I was going to say matches relatively well the idea of plot. The, the problem with plots is that it doesn't exist, right? It's a no, or as far as I understand, it's an architectural notion, but it's it's very hard to get data on actual plots and it's impossible to find it at scale. So what we concluded after doing some experiments is that if you're really interested, say in messing with super accuracy and neighborhood, this is probably not ideal, but because what we want to do at the end of the day is group these things at a, at a higher aggregation to look at the entire, of Great Britain, for example, um, it's a pretty good approximation for what we're interested in. But it is, I mean, ideally, ultimately, the enclosed tessellation cells try to kind of proxy for the plot, which is, it's it's a harder nut to crack. Sure. And I don't so know I if I was missing any question of that round. I, I think not. I have a couple of questions now, which are more about applications of what you do so um adam was asking about you know what your approach offers over geodemographics so when you kind of related it to geodemographics but but what sort of what's better about your method and then adam and carmen both ask about um sort of you know multi-scalar aspects of this so have you tested the analysis for other you know levels of aggregation and what does it look like if you if you kind of zoom out from this uh, super granular level? Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll answer the previous one, which is slightly easier. So, what does it bring that is different to geodemographics? I I just think it's a different animal. I mean, geodemographics you can, you know, most geographers don't really look at them this way, but you can look at it as a classification of one function not even a function of one function which is residential right like you don't have amenities you don't have you have the characteristics of the people who live in different places of course the demographics is a lot of things originally was that now you can have geodemographics of of different things and bespoke but very few cl geodemographic classifications care about the built in, things like the built environment the configuration of that built environment and how that interfaces with what happens inside that built environment. And I think that's one of our USPs that we bring together the kind of stuff that goes on with, you know, we, we bring together the content and the container if you want and build and sort of mash it up, package it up into these classes that tell you about both. And note that I said it's different animal, it's not a better or, or worse. And I think there's a lot of 
opportunity now that we have this kind of a my point about having form and function on demand is that now that we've gone through the pain of building these I think there's a lot of really interesting questions in how form and function crosses with things like productivity with things like um, environmental sustainability emissions but also things like what kind of people live in these places the fact that we have something that's called disconnected suburbia is is a specific sector section of the population that lives there versus the more connected one or or is that randomly allocated so to speak i mean nothing is randomly allocated in socioeconomics right but i think there's a lot of opportunities now to start answering those questions in a way that you can focus much more on the important question and you can sort of bring these almost as a as a built-in as a, as a building block and so that's one and then the second one which was whether well, we've looked at the aggregation. So uh, the, I read that question in two ways. One is whether we tried to build these with different units. And the other one is whether we've looked at aggregation, say whether we've kind of um, passed the signatures through local authority districts or metropolitan areas and so on. So the first one, uh, we you know this was a it was enough of a pain to do once that we didn't do it uh several times but we've done experiments we I, we had a master student work on something like this for barcelona last summer and he was comparing building a classification like this for with a bespoke unit like the enclosed desolation versus something like haze three hexagons which are pretty hot these days outside academia or uh, any other regular grid and what we found was that the, it's a classic MAU, you know, it's a great geographer's win because a classic MAUP story. If you remember the point that I made, that if you look at area, most of the most of Great Britain is um, is basically pastures and and wild nature. But what you really care about is about you know anywhere from one percent to ten percent of the area. And if you want to do a classification that focuses that puts the focus on that you really need to build it into the the unit so when we when we looked at raw h3 hexagons it gets diluted and it wouldn't even pick things like the gothic district in barcelona or the assembly and you know that's like textbook examples that are really easy to pick up morphologically but because compared to you know there's a lot more mountain than than gothic district it, it wouldn't pick it up so we haven't tried it for the whole of Great Britain, but you know my educated guess from other experiments is that actually it would be different in a not great way. So, you know, hopefully it makes sense what we've done. And then in terms of whether we've we've passed this through things, you know, more established definitions of cities, we've started. But it, you know, I would very much welcome any any ideas for collaboration or or sort of follow ups because that 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 won't fit into this paper. Um, but if you think of, you know, I went through those very quickly. But the idea of the signature dish is a little bit like that to visualize how different cities have very different compositions and mixings of of these of these classes. And I think there's a lot more that you could do that we haven't done. But but if you're interested you know, reach out and, and come talk and or just wait for the data to be released. If you want to have a look, you don't have to, you know, I'm not going to claim the monopoly of everything that gets done with, with this data. That seems like a very good point to end because we are exactly on four o'clock. Um, thank you, Danny, for that. That was super interesting. And that's a super interesting discussion that I think we virtual, you know, virtual Zoom applause um, Thanks very much. Thanks. Thank you for that. Again. Thanks, Danny. That's brilliant.